Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us here today for the launch of this new flagship report, which a, a, a copy has been uh, conveniently left on the, on the, uh, on the podium here. Um, uh, this new report called Humanitarianism in the, in the Network Age. I guess we probably need to start off by thinking, well, why are we here today? Globally, there are now apparently 3.3 billion <coughs> smartphone subscriptions. 9.3 billion mobile phone subscriptions, which is a lot more than there are people uh, on the planet. Google forecasts that by 2020, everyone in the world will be connected to the internet. And the majority of those people will be connected by mobile phone, by smartphone. Along with the explosion in the use of mobile phones is the increasing popularity of social media and online information sharing. The developing world is actually leading this growth with homegrown platforms sharing popularity with international platforms like, for example, Facebook. These processes are generating massive digital trails, big data that is a goldmine of information. This trajectory is connecting disparate people and groups, giving them a voice and empowering them to make decisions that affect their lives. We've seen this in the corporate sphere with, vi with viral advertising and on the global political sta stage in countries of the Arab Spring and also right next door in Myanmar. So I guess we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean for humanitarian aid, for our business? Across Asia, we've seen an, incre we've seen an increase in informed, connected, and self-reliant communities generating information accessible to everyone in real time. Mobile communications technology means that our relationship with people affected by emergencies and crises is no longer a one-way street, if it ever was. The world is becoming flatter. Hierarchies are disappearing. Partnerships need to be built on notions of equality and mutual benefit. Communications technology is letting people who find themselves in the midst of emergencies raise their voices. We cannot afford to ignore what they are telling us. This report is aimed at, people, at, aimed at helping people on the ground to make themselves heard, as well as helping humanitarian agencies, whether governmental, non-governmental, international, national, regional, local, listen and react to what they're saying. A phone is now a vital tool in a crisis wherever it happens. The message is clear. Wherever you are, your priority in an emergency is to connect, to find help, to tell your loved ones and your friends that you're okay. But this is really only the start. Through their phones, disaster survivors can now reach not just each other, but support networks across the globe. They can share information, organize ad hoc assistance, transfer money, broadcast their experience, influence politicians, draw attention to their plight, commend those who have helped them, and damn those who haven't. For humanitarians, these developments present opportunities and challenges. We need to make sense of data as quickly as possible in situations where every minute counts, and to turn that data into meaningful information that can be used to save lives and to get assistance to where it's needed. But we also need to, meet, to continue to meet the standards of independent, independence, neutrality, accountability, and transparency. So, how can we adapt? Well, the report really puts forward or identifies four key recommendations. First of all, the ability of survivors to organize their own response depends on the information that they're receiving. That information assumes extraordinary value in times of crisis. The message from affected communities is clear. People urgently need information and ways to communicate. Therefore, the first and most important recommendation is to recognize information and communication as basic needs and rights in humanitarian response. This means establishing ways for people to communicate with each other and to give feedback and voice their demands. Our first speaker, Ramon Esberto from Smart Communications, will tell us how communications in the Philippines has changed how people make contact with each other in disasters. The second recommendation is to make sure that in crisis situations, information is freely shared and accessible to all who need it to inform their decision making. Part of OCHA's mandate is the massive task of information management. But we still rely on written reports, and too often there are parallel data collection processes and parallel reporting. This needs to change. We'll hear from our second speaker, Bob Pickard, on what new technology is out there and how this is changing access to information in disaster response situations. 
The third recommendation is that if aid agencies are to get better at making use of new data sources and information sharing models, we need to improve our technical capacity. The sheer volume of information is outpacing our ability to use it. One way in which OCHA is adapting, for example, is through the development of volunteer groups like the Digital Humanitarian Network. Among other projects, the network played a part in collecting and analyzing the information that went into producing a map that you can see running on the slides here behind me. It shows damage caused by Typhoon Bofa late last year in Mindanao in the Philippines. You can see where bridges are down and houses are flooded. All the information was generated by survivors through photos and videos recorded on mobile phones and upload, uploaded to social media. We're also going to hear this afternoon from Bei Xiao Chao, from Sina Weibo, which recently created an online platform for crowdsourcing private funds for the Lushan earthquake response in China. I'm looking forward to hearing about its successes as well as its pitfalls. And the final recommendation is to ensure that information is used in an ethical and secure manner. Data is never neutral. It reflects political, cultural, and social economic biases, and it is always open to manipulation. Similarly, information tools are not only used to observe conflict, they are also an intrinsic part of the battlefield. We must guard people's privacy and make sure that information is always used in line with best standards of data management and in accordance with humanitarian principles. It's a question of finding a balance between open data and safe data. This report envisages an inter interconnected world in which disaster survivors are at the center of response. The message is that we need to reach out to and to support volunteer technical communities, the private sector, diaspora groups, university students, and governments that are leading this change. We have to adapt to and indeed champion the shift of power from institutions to communities and to people. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over uh, the proceedings to our guest moderator, Will Rogers, who's IFRC's Global Coordinator for Beneficiary Communications and who understands technologies in ways that I um, unfortunately never <laughs> will. He's going to moderate the uh, online discussion that Irina's kindly agreed to host on its website if it's working. It looks so like it's going. Cool. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Well done. Always a captivating speaker. Um, I'll just take this off. Okay. As Oliver said, my name's Will Rogers. I head up the uh, Beneficiary Communications Program for the Federation globally. Um, we're here today to support uh, the project. I'm, I'm the facilitator, sorry, and here to support this project. We um, hope to get a lot of lively discussion. We hope that everybody in the room is actually participating, both uh, on their phones and on our uh, HENA site here. Okay, to use the site, you need to log into the address, obviously the HENA site. You need to log in here with one of your uh, different social media uh, options, and you're in. You're going. You can leave a message and participate. So we're hoping to get a lot of lively discussions. We want anybody who doesn't have a computer in this room, obviously, use your phone. And uh, our first speaker will be Mr. Ramon Isabello. He's the uh, leader, sorry, I'm walking in front of the screen. My apologies. <laughs> He's the, uh, the head of public relations in smart communication in the Philippines and a great campaigner and humanitarianism. A humanitarian, sorry. Okay, well, we have to 15 seconds before Ramon starts. We're not on? Okay, right, slowing down. Are we up? 15 seconds and counting. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Will. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak, uh, make this presentation. I'll make it very the, quick. Uh, um, uh, from bells to hashtags. No? Uh, I, uh, the report that you, that's just been released is very much focused on social media, uh, but I'd like to put this in context because uh, in the real world of emergency communications that we have to live with in the Philippines, it's a much more textured and layered uh, situation that we face. We have all sorts of different communications technologies mixed together, and I'd like to show you how it, how, how it goes. Uh, could we have a... Yes. Okay. Uh, our first big experience in social media in emergency, communi emergency communications took place in 2009, uh, Typhoon Ketsana. 
this was the uh, typhoon that dumped 400 millimeters of rain in six hours in the Metro Manila area and inundated large parts of Metro Manila. Um, the one that started it all was a person who put out this hashtag, rescue, dot, rescue PH. I know the person who did this. Her name is Sarah Mayer. Ma Meyer, I'm sorry. Um, she, we know her because she used to be a, uh, one of our endorsers at Smart Communications. She's a fashion model. And she, she put out this uh, uh, hashtag rescue, dot, uh, rescue PH and started a ball rolling. People started exchanging information. And the reason why it's rescue is because a lot of people ended up in their rooftops, in their homes, because their, ho their homes are flooded. And they were asking for help. Um, many of them, well, their phones weren't working or their network was down. Uh, as, a, as a commercial, our network was up. Uh, but <laughs> and, and people were asking for help. And she started the ball rolling, and it went like wildfire. People picked it up and exchanged information. Then somebody added, OK, uh, let's put on hashtag relief PH, where people were asking, or rather exchanging information about areas or individuals or families that needed relief. Uh, but this, this is what started the ball rolling as far as uh, social media for emergency communications in the Philippines is concerned in 2009. Very informal. People were doing it on Twitter, on, on Facebook, using Google Maps. Uh, mostly Facebook, at least at that point. Twitter community in 2009 was relatively small. Facebook, 95 penetration rate for online people in the Philippines. So people were really using Facebook heavily. Um, the challenge here, however, is that, and I'll get back to this later on, it's very informal. You have different groups coming together uh, for all sorts of different reasons, different purposes, but then galvanizing during an emergency situation, which is fine when it's an emergency situation, but what do you do in the meantime when there's no emergency? Let me get back to that later on. Next slide, please. Uh, yes. uh, can I have it? Okay. But I wanted to give the context of what's happening uh, by going back in time, literally in time as well as in technology terms. You see those red uh, orange, uh, those are bells, okay? Uh, those are, th actually those are acetylene tanks that you cut in half and you make them into bells. Uh, this was actually a United Nations Development Program project. <laughs> project ready in the Philippines. Uh, and we, be we, we got, we got uh, joined this project. And part of the project was to have an emergency communication system in the hinterlands of different parts of the country where either cellular co communications was not available or rather spotty at that time. So they wanted a system of bells where people would have a pre-agreed set of signals that if there's something that's going on, particularly in communities, heavy, heavy downpour that could cause flash floods, ring the bell several times, and you pass, then you have a string of bells in different parts of the uh, area, then you pass the signal around. We distributed about 300, 350 of these bells in different parts of the country. And they may, may look very unwieldy, but they work. <laughs> We've been told of several instances in different parts of the country where communities and families were actually saved during heavy downpour situations and where the flash floods can, can all of a sudden hit, you, hit your communities. For example, in the province of Zambales, which is on the island of Luzon. There were several instances in which these technologies were used. Okay, here's another technology that we still use, part of our emergency communications a portfolio, uh, free call centers. Whenever there's a disaster, whenever there's a need for communications, we put up these uh, free call centers. We especially, we, we bring them to the affected communities so that people can call, mostly their relatives, and sometimes their friends. If you've ever sat through conversations of this nature, the thing that you will appreciate, it's not just an exchange of information. Although they're asking for help, usually asking for money or some kind of assistance, uh, there's a lot of emotional interchange because that's the nature of voice. Good old voice technology is still the best medium for communicating emotions. And that's still very, very much used whenever we have a disaster situation. This one is good old SMS, okay? It's a web-based tool. 
uh, but used in a very precise and scientific way. The service is called InfoBoard. Uh, we implemented this in a number of communities, one of them in a World Bank sponsored or rather a uh, funded project in Southern Leyte, which is one of the most hazardous areas in the country. Um, uh, that, that, that Southern Leyte went through a rather bad time a couple of years ago. They had this huge landslide, buried an entire village. About 2,000 people died. And so the province started to take disaster preparedness seriously. World Bank funded a project. We provided the technology. It's a very simple tool. It's web-based. But what's important is the way it's used. It's used as part of an organization. The web-based tool is used to send messages to people who identified as part of a disaster prepared, prepare, uh, prepare, uh, preparedness network. And these people are trained and they provide feedback. Uh, the utility of this service was demonstrated very clearly uh, in February 2012. There was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake in Negros, just off uh, Negros Oriental. I don't know if I have a map here. Yeah, here it is. This is Negros Oriental. This is where the earthquake took place. Um, in Manila, uh, somebody issued a tsunami alert level 2, which means watch out for unusual movement of water, either receding or waves. But don't do anything. It's, it's, it's an alert level that you're supposed to monitor what's going to happen to the wa water levels. However, what happened here in the island of Cebu was a radio announcer uh, early in the morning picked up the news and dropped alert level, didn't say alert level 2. He simply said, oh, there is a tsunami alert. What happened was in the city of Cebu, people panicked. Uh, you had people running up to the fifth floor of their buildings. Uh, you had people going up the hillsides. Uh, and it took quite a while before the thing settled down. But here, in southern Leyte, where these people were using this service, the Provincial Disaster Coordinating Council disseminated an explanation of what alert level two means in the local language to their disaster volunteers deployed in the villages in the areas that would be affected. No panic. Then we go back to the present. Um, the point of what I, my previous part of my presentation is that different technologies can be used effectively for different purposes. And uh, I think just like playing a piano, you don't hit just one note. The best way to do it is to hit several notes, then you can have a good symphony, uh, a good melody. If we go back to social media, what is it, mo what is it most effective for? Well, one of them is crowdsourcing information, getting people mobilized, and um, getting a lot of people together in one, once, uh, one virtual scenario, working together in concert. The experience we had in the Philippines was a lot of volunteer groups, but there was, a, there was uh, in our observation, a, something missing. Connecting all of this information and all of this activity to the disaster response authorities. Uh, our current project now in this area is we're trying to get the bloggers, social media people, to get into the same room with the disaster planners at the national level, at the regional level, and at the local level. Uh, it's a project that we call Get Ready Pinas. Pinas is our nickname for Philippines. It's a disaster preparedness program in which we're going to try to get these different elements together in one room, first physically and then later on in the virtual space. And perhaps connect all of this dynamic activity that's happening in social media with the, the, both the planners as well as the responders. And let's see what happens if we can get them to work together. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramon, for that uh, discussion. Bells to hashtags. Great sort of thought, and it's interesting to see the uh, obviously the the use of old technologies as well as new technologies in the Philippines. The um, something that uh, personally I thought of when uh, when we were going through the uh, slides 
is that now there's a lot of different players in the field. The humanitarian sector is not the only player in a, in a disaster anymore. So we have the uh, mobile phone companies, the social media people, there's the, uh, the normal humanitarians, the Red Cross people, there's people sitting in their houses sending out SMSs and tweets. You know, what does this actually mean and can all this information actually all create misinformation? And what can misinformation? We talk about like the need to create information and get information out, but what can misinformation do? The questions from the, uh, there's, there's only a few sort of questions um, that came through the thing, but are there any questions here on the floor? Is there anybody that would like to sort of comment on uh, Ramon's uh, bells to hashtags? Yeah? I think the um, important thing about the whole sort of integration of uh, technology into into this sphere and, and, the, and the document itself is getting so much information that we can't manage and I think Oliver sort of touched on it in his sort of discussion about big data. With so many people sort of pumping information out there, how are we actually going to manage that information? And when does it turn into an outcome? Are we just fishing for information? Are we data farming? Is the information actually going to make any difference to what we do? If somebody asks for help, does somebody come? And what sort of expectations are we setting out by doing this stuff? They're just things to think about. So if we don't have any sort of um, specific questions off the blog or in the room, we can head on to our next speaker, who is Mr. Bob Picard who's a humanitarian, uh, sorry, <laughs> a PR executive, sorry, and a humanitarian, no doubt, um, based in Singapore. He's known globally, and um, he's here to give, his, give us his perception on the work we're doing, and his own, of course. Thank you, Bob. Many thanks indeed, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I guess I should ask by taking the, the temperature of the room, how many of you have an account on Facebook? Hands up. Everybody. Okay, let's just try another question. How many of you on Twitter? Hands up. Two-thirds, maybe, 70%. Um, Foursquare, a few. And Pinterest, perhaps? A few more. Okay, well, that helps me calibrate my comments accordingly. <laughs> um, okay, so we're all on Facebook, which has become worldwide, sort of like a social operating system. Uh, tying all of these different countries together. China, of course, the great exception, which an, another speaker will address. Um, if I could ask for the advance to the next slide, then I can just jump into the point of view that I want to uh, communicate uh, with you today. Now, I'm a public relations executive. Now, as I'm going to describe, the meaning of PR is changing around the world. But I don't know if you've noticed this, but I surely have. Just about anything that goes wrong in the world today is now called a PR disaster. Um, you know, the BP oil spill, you know, was that a PR disaster or did that oil really ruin the Gulf of Mexico? Um, the Tiger Woods scandal, um, you know, was that, was that a PR disaster or were there various misdemeanors that occurred there? Uh, the Toyota recall, you know, was that a PR disaster or did those people really die in those cars? So what's happening around the world is that the, the concept of disaster as it's related to PR, public relations, is becoming far more profound, far, far more high profile. It seemed to be uh, a critically important corporate function. And I think that social media clearly is at the forefront of disaster response you know, and preparation and, and follow-up for both you know, the humanitarian sector, as it's traditionally called, and for multinational corporations. Now, it's pretty clear that the dimensions of any kind of disaster are usually pretty staggering and, and too complex and too large for any one institution to solve on its own. And I think this is really changing the meaning of, of PR from public relations, one to many communications, to public relationships, where different characters, different institutions in society have to work together towards common action. Now, I think where the online meets the offline and where the digital meets the analog, that that provides the rallying point for meaningful action, as we'll see in the presentation as we advance through it. And here's the, the clicker so I can do that myself. 
how did we find out about disaster beyond personally experiencing it in localities, you know, more than 100 years ago? Well, it was through the, the print media. This one's the San Francisco earthquake in the United States. Um, then as we moved into the broadcast media, we found out, and here's the famous Hindenburg example, we found out about it through radio. Then, and many of us would have seen this, the, the Challenger disaster of the 1980s. Television was, was the means of finding out about disaster around the world, Ethiopia famine, for example, in many parts of the world. This was the, the state-of-the-art technology for finding out about it back in the 80s. But this, completely different than what we've seen before, is what it looks like today. This is the Oklahoma tornado uh, page that, this is the crisis map that Google put up, um, showing different dimensions of data in terms of what was happening, where it was happening, and, and how to understand the enormity of that, of that disaster. Um, now, I think if we're talking about how different actors in the social media world are addressing and preparing for disasters, we have to talk about Google's crisis response capabilities and what they're trying to do to embrace it. Um, now, I've got five to eight minutes to summarize all this, so I won't dwell on it for now. I think, though, because we all represent organizations here, the important thing to remember is that if you want to be effective at social media for anything, including disaster response, it all begins on the inside. It's important to co-create the communications content with the people who comprise your organization before you attempt to do so outside for it to be truly effective, for it to be authentic, and for it to enjoy widespread support uh, with all of the different touch points of your organization. Now, when you ask people um, if they want to be part of a communications effort, that creates the anticipation of their participation in that effort. And so it's, it's radically important that you set expectations and understand emotions uh, to ensure the best results. Now, I, I like to put up this slide of, of Dale Carnegie when I talk about this topic because he said, and this book was written in 1936, the key, the key to communications is to um, make the other person feel important and to do it sincerely. This, I contend, is the basis of the modern marketing business. Making people feel important, like you care about them, like you're listening to them, like they could play an important role in taking meaningful action, this is what gets them involved. And they like to see themselves in the involvement visual, uh, data journalism, uh, digital storytelling, where data is plotted against design expressed in maps. One reason why people like this so much is because it represents them. Um, now, I talked about expectations. It's really important that you say to, to somebody before you talk with them, um, you are important to us. We are listening to you. Please help us help you and the community at large. And we need your opinions, your intelligence, and your ideas to inform our actions so that we can be more timely, smarter, more effective. Now, there is this, this, this idea, and we've all been bulldozed by the nifty apps and the different channels of the social media technology to conclude that communication is all about pushing a message into people's face and they will just sort of passively consume this. I, I would say to you that to be effective in a crisis, during, before, or afterward, listening to people, making them feel important, is the, is the most important thing to begin with. And of course, whether or not the listening is genuine or whether or not you have the infrastructure, the resources internally to listen to people, it increases the demand of people to be heard. Now, I hate to put it in this way because it sounds almost cynical, but social media amplifies the self, the me, the I. And so what we see is the rise of this narcissistic tendency, lack of attention span, an unrealistic impatience and we see angers like anger and other emotions. So I think you really have to consider thoughtfully before any kind of social media effort, how are you emotionally going to connect with people? Not just the logic of clicking this or ticking that, but, but how, are, how are people going to share it? How are they going to sweat it? How are they going to bleed it? So I think that's a very important thing to look at. These are the so-called seven deadly digital sins that I like to talk <laughs> about. People want something. They need something. They must have more. They haven't thought about it. Um, they're angry about something and they want that which somebody else has. Um, I'm better. I wish to associate myself with something online that makes me look smarter, tougher, richer, better. You know, these are the things that we have to deal with. Um, now, I think there's something called social media intelligence or SQ. You've heard of IQ, cognitive intelligence. EQ, emotional intelligence. I think this social intelligence is very important indeed. If you're going to convene 
a community of people online to, to deal with a, a humanitarian disaster, I think you have to explain clearly right from the start what the community is about. Um, you should be designing the community with outputs in mind. What is it you're asking people to do? Um, and what is it you're not asking them to do? I think outlining process, setting expectations, um, making sure you think of the temporal aspect before, during, and after, and, and determining the communication preferences uh, of the people with whom you seek to have a communications relationship. That's all very important. I'm just going to show you this slide. It's my Pinterest page. Everything is heading in a visual direction. Half of our brain that is dealing with making decisions about uh, marketing or what to, what to buy, what to do, it's all geared towards consuming stuff through a visual story frame. And this is why it's becoming so important. Dr. Cialdini, University, uh, in Ar University of Arizona, he wrote a book called Influence. Have any of you read this book out of interest? Okay. Where his six principles of persuasion go online and, and intersect with social media, this will help you understand what people do online and why they do it. For example, when somebody clicks a like button on Facebook, they have created a new image template of themselves as, for example, the kind of person who cares about this humanitarian disaster. And that person, from that point forward, and it's called the principle of consistency, will say or do that which is uh, consistent with that principle that they have articulated in front of their network of friends or family from that point forward. So, it's like signing a public confession. The professor who did this study found that when prisoners of war would sign written confessions, the reason their, their captors uh, would, would make them do it is that there'd be a chance that that person would actually have a greater chance of, of, of acting in a manner consistent with their confession. True story. Um, look at this, 710,000 likes on Facebook for the Global Disaster Relief page that they have you know, famously set up recently. Now, um, I don't want to tax your time too much in setting the stage for the deeper discussion, but this is, this is starting to get a little out of date, 11 months ago. Facebook really is a worldwide phenomena. Um, everyone everywhere seems to use it with some of these great example exceptions here. Um, but let's underline this fact. Where we are here today, here in Asia, this is the most dynamic region in the world when it comes to social media. We have a speaker from China coming. That, that market is among the more interesting. We also have these social media platforms all over Asia. Um, I think Line, um, which is out of, out of Japan, uh, mobile messaging is probably the most interesting one to talk about. Um, here in Thailand, I think there are more than 15 million users of that platform. There was a power blackout in the south of this country a few days ago. Uh, this was a very useful mechanism for um, people to deal with the media and, and with uh, authorities in terms of what's going on or get information about what's happening. Now, um, Tencent, a company which uh, some people uh, have uh, likened to Facebook, the Chinese Facebook, although it's quite different in terms of its it's functioning. It is a Chinese provider of instant messaging services and it is expanding around the world from an Asia out. So it's not just us in Asia importing the Twitters and the Facebooks, it's Asia with Line and with WeChat exporting to the rest of the world. The hottest thing right now in social media is not Twitter, it's not Facebook, it's, it's the instant messaging applications for mobile devices that are coming out of Asia today. This is the next great wave. So, uh, I'm not going to do the rest of my slides in detail, but I just wanted to offer a cautionary point here. If you look at, at the opportunities here, they're immense. We have the technology. We have the, the sincere interest of people here in using the social platform to get involved, to make a difference, uh, to be part of it. Um, but one of our greatest shortcomings is that senior people in positions of authority, in multinational corporations, and in any type of hierarchical organization, if you ask me, they may be reluctant or fearful, or they may be lagging in adopting some of these methods. I call it executive leadership density. So I think among decision makers, uh, we have to keep it uh, simple and show them the benefits so that they themselves will come to champion this new technology right from the top. It's not just the technology, though. It's a revolution in how people I interact with each other, the psychology, the relationships, and what they do and think, um, which is you know, really going to have a transformative effect in all of our societies. I, I would end with just these success factors. Perhaps we'll post the presentation later and you, could, you can take a look at it. But I would, I would um, say that number one, designing the community. Number two, 
shutting up and listening to people before you tell them what to think, asking them what they have to share first, seeking permission to communicate with them, knowing their emotions, and possessing a personality. These, these top five are very important. Companies and organizations have historically had a habit of acting like, like things, like robots, just spouting a, a line. But now there's a personification that's occurred. Brands, and NGOs can be brands, uh, you know, people can be brands, uh, not just companies. They should have a personality. They should have feelings. They should have a sense of humor. They should have a way of doing things. So this is the great change. We have to bring to life the, that, that flavor, that, 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 that sensible feeling for the, the way that an organization really is in a human way. And with that, I would just thank you for your time and attention and welcome any questions. Swap with you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that was fantastic. There's been a few questions come through, which is good. The uh, the blog's starting to liven up a bit now, which is fantastic. Um, one of the questions, uh, well, it seems that everybody's making big statements that obviously listening is a very important thing for the humanitarian sector to do, which I, which I agree with. The outcome is also the important thing. Um, one of the questions, Bob, that you might be able to ask is, uh, how can local NGOs connect with the business sector? What's the best way to do that? I, I think the first uh, avenue of approach should be the, the uh, introduction of a, of, of a, a reason to, to have that relationship. Um, I, I think there may be just a lack of understanding on the part of a private sector actor what it is that they would, they would gain or, or what it is that they would do um, what, what the bandwidth would be for engaging with you. So I think having a clear idea of what the engagement would be like and how you could work together um, in a concrete way, I, th I think that's, that's a hugely important thing to do. I mean, I don't know if the person who asked the question had a specific example in mind, but I, I think there's just a lack of understanding. Um, and I think there's such an information overload right now. People are exceedingly busy and overwhelmed by this, this, this monstrous quantity of, of information that they don't have the ability to think. Um, so I think showing people and breaking through that clutter what the win-win would be and what the tangible result would be of a collaboration or interaction, I think that would be the way to go. I know that sounds very general, but that's, that's all I would have on that. Step in the ring. Get in there and talk to them. Okay, um, I suppose another question was, uh, what do you see as the similarities between the business sector and the humanitarian sector's uh, models of engagement? And to rephrase that, maybe if um, if affected people are customers, how good a business, how good a, is the humanitarian sector as a business? I think the main point is that the humanitarian sector, unlike business, would not have people automatically assume that what you're saying has a selfish agenda in mind. Maybe some organizations they have a fundraising agenda, or they want more members. Um, or by rallying a constituency, they get more things that will help them uh, systemically. But I, I think there's a lot more goodwill. Uh, trust in business, uh, the belief in the selfless nature of a corporate marketing agenda, I'd say is, is very low. So I think you have the ability uh, to become super credible brands in your own right. I, I think that you can become not, not passive, but the more active player, um, and capitalize on your strength, which is... Um, your, your broader alignment um, with some of the most profound problems facing society. Um, I would also speak emotionally in a way that a business could never possibly hope to do, um, to bring the human story to life, um, visually with pictures, e emotively with, with video or with motion graphics. Um, there are ways for you, I think, to tell a story that, that really um, impact people in a way that a, a business agenda never could hope to do. Excellent. Are there any uh, more questions from the floor? Anybody else want to uh, ask anything from Bob? No? Any more up here? Okay. What have we got up here? Is it working? It's coming through now. That's great. Okay, there's lots of questions. Bob, do you want to read some of those? What have we got? Listening to simple solutions such as bells ringing the alarm. It's great. Great to see emphasis on low-tech solutions. Of course, absolutely. 
Paid, sorry, was I talking? Go on. Thanks for your great presentation, Bob. I'm curious, it was interesting to read about the narcissism of social media, as you highlighted, and Time Magazine recently had an interesting article about the young generation called the millennials, and based off of the fact that they're really used to this narcissism. But uh, I was interested in your opinion as well, because you, you mentioned the way that we can engage senior leadership. And in my experience, I found that senior leadership is very uncomfortable with this narcissism. And I'm wondering what you recommend to help bridge that gap, if that makes sense. I think there's a huge generation gap. I think people in their 40s and 50s and, 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 and older, uh, they were brought up in a world where uh, they could con consume and pay attention to long form information. Um, there was lots of time to tell a story. And now attention span is virtually non-existent. It's like in the, in the blink of an eye or the snap of your fingers. And that's why we see the rise of these infographics, right? You, you have to tell a complex story through data attractively designed in some kind of compelling picture or colorful map so that people can size up and understand something just like that uh, in no amount of time at all. So I think their, their minds are wired differently for the consumption of temporal information. Also, I think this is Asia. And in some places, I think, especially in a conservative hierarchical organization, um, face can be more important than Facebook. Um, and a lot of important decisions around social media, and I've been to a lot of these meetings, are not being made because there'll be a senior executive there who uh, may not have the experience um, that some of the younger people may have with social media. They don't have that nim nimble or agile understanding that comes from personal use. And so they will not discuss in front of their subordinates um, some of these social issues in a way that might risk revealing their ignorance in a way where there could be a face risk. And so the decisions simply aren't made at a senior level. Um, so I think the way to bridge the gap um, is to take the massive data we now have at our disposal. Some of these senior executives, some of the people in authority, they love numbers. They were brought up in a world of, of you know, a, a more angular world, a more metric world, where proof points, charts, all the stuff that digital can now provide, analytics. This information could be packaged, I think, to, to communicate in a way that's consonant with the sensibilities of senior executives so that they can make the decisions now from the top that'll make some of these things more effective. That's, in a corporate way, what we've done to break through some of that executive density. Thank you, Bob. And I think they've got a direct hit question to you here. How, ca how um, Mr. Picard mentions to seek permission, but how can we do that in the middle of a disaster? Any ideas on that one? I think in terms of the corporate, the, the corporate narrative that you communicate as an organization in an ongoing way, um, what you want to have before any crisis occurs is a constitu constituency of people as broad as possible with whom you already have a relationship. So it's not just insta community in the, in the case of a disaster. I think having that, having that, pr that, that set of relationships pre-established is going to be in your interest. So when you're doing that, that's when you seek permission. Um, you don't presume to have relationships with people who don't have an interest in, in touching you or, 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 or participating with you. So I don't think that does apply in the case of an actual disaster. I think, I think you um, have a relationship with those who you, whom you can help. And if somebody asks you for help and you aren't the one to give it, but you can point them in the right direction, and then you do that. You, you refer them. Roman, come on down. I just wanted to add to, I think, an important made, uh, point that was made here. Um, for example, I mentioned earlier at the end of my presentation that one of the things we're going to do now is to get the, respon the disaster response officials to sit down with the bloggers and the social media types, which is not an easy thing to do. It's like bringing together the long-haired people with uh, crew-cut guys. <laughs> because most of the disaster response uh, people in the government are actually military people. And, and the, the bloggers come from all sorts of different kinds of communities. But it's that face-to-face -face meeting which we think is going to be crucial in building the kind of interface that you'd like to see down the road. Because all this stuff that's being generated in social media is just passing by the disaster response community as, oh, it's a, it's a nice thing, it's interesting, it's curious, but is it really useful? Uh, and that's the breakthrough that we need to make in, 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 in the Philippines, getting disaster response officials to take this, this technology seriously. And, and you, won't, you won't do that in a lecture. 
you're going to have to get these people together in somehow in some kind of forum or in some kind of occasion. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do now. Um, I, I agree to very much with the point that the decision makers don't quite get it. Uh, and that's the problem. And we have to get the decision makers to see the value of this kind of technology, how it can be used, and the purposes for which it can be applied. Yeah. It's always a hard thing to get the decision makers on board. I suppose that's the same, you know, getting um, support in disasters. Sometimes that's a bit of a struggle for uh, some of the smaller NGOs and um, humanitarians. Okay, can social media reach the most vulnerable in Asia or are we focusing on the mobile elite? What a great question. I think what we do get carried, and I'm not sure if this, whoever's put this up, Jamie, um, is that, <laughs> Jamie, nice question. I'm going to answer this one. I think that we sort of get carried away with the whole smartphone thing. Oop. <laughs> and that's what's happened. So you get carried away with smartphones, you're all over the place. The, um, we get carried away with smartphones. I was looking at some stats the other day. Get rid of that stuff. <laughs> About the time I got saying, I got bloody off my chest. Is, um, is smart, I was looking at stats. Indonesia, what, 240 or 250 billion people and about 45% have smartphones, yeah? So I don't know, what is that, 120 million or something like that have smartphones. So there's this all other 120 million people that don't have internet access and don't have access to smartphones. So the work I do on the Red Cross, what we're always sort of saying is we've got to look at the lowest common denominator. And for us, that's like SMS maybe, or even face-to-face. -face. If you're using communications, then it's probably SMS. Sorry, oh, radio. <laughs> FM radio, please. I'm, I'm Charlotte from BBC Media Action in Bangladesh. And just to follow on with that comment, um, uh, uh, mobile penetration in Bangladesh is uh, way over 90%, but it really is just sort of very basic phone. And, and the majority of people cannot use it text even or read text on it. Um, and what we're seeing in a sort of political crisis at the moment is that the digital divide between the elite bloggers and the... But, I mean, only 5% of the population have ever used the internet. Um, so there's a, there's a huge digital divide that um, creates a, a massive confusion between old and new technologies, old and new worlds. And my concern is that in a disaster, that that becomes even more polarized and that the most vulnerable with the least information become, you know, not only um, not only sort of you know in danger of their lives, but also you know the the communication divide creates more problems. So so I'd be interested to hear what people's opinions are about you know forget the smartphones you know in a in a sort of a country where there's complete you know there's fifty percent illiteracy. It's it's really uh, going to be a major challenge. I was in Bangladesh on, on Earth Day, and my friends there were uh, finding it rather amusing that they were being asked to turn their lights off uh, for a certain period of time because the lights weren't on anyway. Um, I think that's a great question, and I think we've seen it in other markets all over Asia. All I would say is this. I think where the uh, uh, power of social media commands the attention because it's the latest, the greatest, the newest. The, I mean, that's very interesting. It's the people who are the, are the opinion formers and, and the influencers or the elite, if you will, who they, they're the ones who embrace it first. Um, often this group includes media, journalists. Um, so I, I think the, the, social, the social journalists out there, including in countries like Bangladesh, they use social media to get story ideas. They don't have great budgets. So the, uh, the, the digital media allows them to get ideas, sources, pictures, video. Um, it also, I think, though, is important to realize that radio uh, and print um, sh in, in countries such as Bangladesh, countries such as India, for example, this is still massively important. I mean, print circulation, for example, in India is still growing. It's 100 million plus. It keeps on going up. So any, any communications campaign in India, to be serious, it can't just focus on social media. It's got to look at, at traditional print. And then, of course, there's the diversity of some of these countries, like India, all the dialects, all the different communities. The, the hundreds, if not thousands, of local 
uh, newspapers and ways of spreading the word. Um, any communications campaign in India these days would typically have an SMS component. Um, radio. Um, you know, in, South, in much of South Asia, you can still listen to BBC World Service on, on short wave. I mean, when is the last time you could do that in a lot of more developed countries? So I think, I think that is very important. So I think the really cool thing, though, is that where you, where you have the uh, online uh, digital media meet the offline analog media, that's often the sweet spot. Um, the digital media will, will capture pictures and experiences that then can be fed to the more traditional analog media with resources that they themselves do not have. Um, so there can be, I think, this overlap or symbiotic relationship where everybody does win because you have all of these citizen journalists, even if it is a tiny minority, giving content to media outlets who otherwise have blind spots. Okay, before we go to the next question, we'll have um, Biao Xiao Zhao, sorry, who um, works for Weibo and uh, obviously China's biggest social media platform and the founder of the Chinese social media charity in Union. Please, thank you, come on down. And then we'll get back into more questions after that. Good afternoon, everyone. I come from Weibo. The Weibo, its Chinese name is Sims Microblog. As Weibo is a, a branding of the Xinan, and the Xinan is the first Chinese web page in the Xinan web page, and also a first blog in China, and also a first microblog. Name is Weibo. And now we have 5 million, 527 million users in China, just to you pan with three years. And totally we talk about the Twitter, six years, almost 500 million users. And very specially, just uh, more users is in China. And uh, unluckily, we can't connect with Facebook and Twitter, but the Chinese people, we need communication, we need social media. So you can see Tencent, WeChat, and also Xinlang Weibo, we're just uh, buying the Chinese user. And the communication, the power. The topic is social media for social good and ways the social power. That means we use 500 million people. So for now, we have the verified industry professional and also government. Very important is government. They want to open for the social media and also they want to connect it with the Chinese people. There is 16,000 account from the government and official. And also we have some business account. And the media is very important for the challenge for the new media and the tradition, traditional media. They all also open the media account in a Weibo. Yep, this slide is very important for me and also for the Weibo. Because you know the Chinese government want to um, control and also afraid of social media, especially Weibo. But they need social media. Yeah. And uh, this is progress from the Chinese government open progress. They step step want to understand the social media power and also they learn to how to communicate with the Chinese web user. At the mobile, the mobile age. Yesterday, the queen of the internet, Mary Miko, they launched a new trade reporting. And they mentioned the mobile is really coming. And in Weibo, 75% the user can accept the Weibo with the mobile devices. This is a crazy because and, uh, we have uh, a big, cha big challenge with the WeChat from the Tencent a company that mentioned. Of, uh, uh, and the Weibo 
with the WeChat is a uh, different. And WeChat can be communication internal instant messages. And WeChat uh, for Weibo is very um, for internal and private. For the Weibo is like a media pl platform. They want to open and also communication for the unknown peoples. So uh, we gave a presentation for our new platform like a micro charity platform. They mean a social fundraising platform in based Weibo platform. The vision is the simplicity, transparency, and the achievability. And as this picture, a uh, young earthquake, um, 10 million US dollar after earthquake, just uh, one day, 24 hours, the social fundraising platform is work very well. And uh, more than 100,000 people can use this platform to help the young earthquake. This platform is launched uh, last February, just one year, more than one year. And uh, we focus, help Chinese NGO, Chinese foundation. You know, in Chinese is very, um, the philosophy is under the control of the government. There is 3,000 foundation totally in China. And uh, half of the foundation is under the official. And also half is, is the, you know, the company private function. Foundation. We, this is beginning from 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. Before 2008, there is less than a private foundation, almost its official foundation. And this five years, there is many 100, uh, 1,000 foundation is still created by the government and licenses to open. And also, they are very, they are, there is no power, and then they need the social media. And we, deep, we create an, a deep cooperation with Chinese foundation and also Chinese NGO. We help them. First thing is help them fundraise it. And then build the reputation. And with this young earthquake, the total is changed. Before young, young earthquake, the official foundation is very powerful. They reject uh, the private foundation. And this time, a, a very famous foundation which launched by Jet Li is one foundation. They, <coughs> they, they have uh, 300 million RMB in this young earthquake with help of the uh, Weibo. And also, there, there is uh, two million people, the donor, help the One Foundation. And the question is coming. One Foundation is afraid of so many money, so many. They, they are afraid to spend the money. They have a deep discuss to how to respect uh, the donor. And uh, we also found a new work model for this, for the information. The young earthquake is three seconds after a first Weibo is launched by a normal user. After one minute, the official Weibo is launched. So the information is very faster than the official media. And uh, also the other thing is a channel. Chinese people want to choose which, which channel I can help the young earthquake. And also in our social fundraising platform, we help the 15, fo 15 foundation to launch the 26 program. It's very different program. And uh, every user can choose which program can help the young earthquake. And also, 
the company and also the famous the public sky, which helped the the young skeg. And also the transparency. After the golden 72 hours, and everyone can focus the, to uh, how to how to serve in the money. In this young earthquake is one billion RMB will help the young earthquake, but the transparency is the most important for every donor. And we have a uh, we have a deep cooperation with Chinese Foundation Center. We build a new platform to transparency for every uh, donor, and also we build a system to online reporting and also every day update the new information for every donors. So this is the, our ICT model, and also like uh, Weibo crisis response model. And uh, this is the MC micro charity platform, the impact. Uh, first thing is the, is the, the money we, we have fundraising is 126 million RMB. And uh, 4,000 is a program. Just uh, 15 months, we have launched the 4,000 program. And also, this is the uh, 2 million user can directly donors. And every day, there is a uh, 200,000 people is active user on our platform. And that's all. Thank you. If you have some question, yeah. Thank you very much, Roger. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, we have a question straight off, Mr. Lowry. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, wow. Uh, that was uh, pretty powerful, um, and so many impressions from that brief presentation. I mean, the, the first one is chapeau to the organisers for bringing in, bringing in Weibo, um, because you know your voice is missing from far too many discussions on social media and and the power of uh, of social media, um, and that was just a, a mind blowing presentation. Really, I hope I'm speaking for other people in the room when I say that. I mean, what you, you showed us, you know, the the dynamics. The, the way you're changing dynamics in your society, um, which is, as we know, one of the most difficult ones to, to change, the, the element of choice you're bringing in, um, the challenge to authority and, and, and to, um, to monoliths there, um, and just the way that you're mobilizing people is, is absolutely incredible. Um, I'm sure a lot of other people would have <coughs> comments to, to make on that, but I've got a question to, um, not, not so much to you, but to another short-haired man in the room, Mr. Hall. Uh, the, the short-haired men were mentioned earlier on. I'm just, um, I'm just curious. <laughs> well, and I, I want to bring you back to where, where you and I would have started our careers, probably, um, to, to the Balkan Wars, where, you, as, as you remember, the challenge to coordination was every, everyone and the world and their spouse wanted to, to get, an, you know, to go over and, and help the Bosnians. And it was, it was extremely dangerous. Um, and we've seen you know, the power of Weibo um, bringing in citizen activists uh, to, to the earthquake zone to provide the aid that they think is needed, and often they're right. Um, I would say also, the si sidebar, that you're, it's pretty clear you're putting us all out, out of jobs as well um, by what you're doing, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's to be welcomed in some ways. But what would have happened, what, what will happen uh, in the next uh, sort of Balkans war um, with, with, with this? How do we deal with this challenge to, co to coordination? Can we come back to that one? Okay, Shadal, there was a question here um, about how you ensure transparency for the pro for the projects that people are donating money to. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, from the transparency, we have a big data system to every donor, and also we have the um, the connect uh, contact with the donor with the mobile phone and with the Weibo. And everybody can, can download the online reporting of the transparency and on our platform. And if you if he have some question, you can you know, post a Weibo 
and also we uh, immediately to have a response of feedback and directly and response the questions. And also we have uh, permit this question for the communication with the other, the type of the questions. And so I think is the uh, communication is so, so important for ways to communicate with the donor. Because in China, you know, the Chinese user haven't um, the philosophy awareness. They want to know something, but they haven't to channel. And so they trust the Weibo and also they post the, uh, the, the Weibo and uh, communicate with directly with the CFC, with uh, the Weibo and with the One Foundation like, like this. Yeah. And while you're there, there's another question that came up. Um, are online charity platforms the end of traditional aid organizations in China? So will Weibo change the way things happen? We, we won't, but you know, <laughs> It's so difficult to get, yeah, I, in my way, I think uh, is the balance with the governmental foundation and also with the, you know, private foundation. Uh, and Weibo is an independent platform. We need government and we, we need the local motivation. And also, we can build the independent platform to help them have the government and have a private function, uh, have the local NGO. And uh, we, we want to promote their more communication with them and also exchange the information because you know the government will have more, uh, more powerful information connected system. And also the local NGO can very powerful with the execution for the program launched by the foundation. And, uh, we want it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Just wonder, how, are you planning to replicate this, this kind of platform in other countries where you have also customers? I guess Weibo is international now. Or? Um, the, the Weibo is the <laughs> private sector. We are not an uh, official sector. And uh, we just, um, you know, for the pri private sector, the uh, first thing is, is the business model. We, uh, we, why we launched the, the micro charity platform? Uh, this is our social responsibility. We focus one thing and we try to do the, it better. If the government, and I know uh, this time in the earthquake, the Minister of Civil Affairs have a meeting with us. And we talk about how to cooperation with help them. It's not a control them. The government is changed by Weibo, I think. And they, they need the local activity, and they, they need the Weibo's power, and then also the need in the Weibo's platform. And uh, uh, we build a, a union uh, with the Weibo and the government and uh, official, uh, an official, the Gangos, and also local NGO. And we build an online platform to talk about and discuss some problem with uh, after the uh, young earthquake. And also, I think it's totally changed before the young earthquake. And I mean, young earthquake may be a milestone for the Chinese charity and for Chinese community race uh, affairs, I think. Because uh, in, in at the same time, in Chinese uh, uh, province Jiangsu, we launched a big session, is a summit, just to talk about the change of the Chinese philosophy, especially the, you know, the Chinese government system and with the local active systems, come how to integrate the resources and uh, want to save the, the lives with the, you know, the, the, the same thing as earthquake or floods. Yeah. Thank you very much going to try and answer Joe's question, um, probably not very effectively. I mean, th I think this report, Joe, um, that we have here is the first attempt, certainly on Ocha's part, to get out in front of the game, actually trying to look forward rather than catch up. I've worked in information management in Ocha se on several occasions, and we're always playing catch up. We're always coming out with the piece of technology that everyone did two or three years ago. And this, I think, is an attempt for us to get out in front. So there's some, I think there's some revised thinking we're pushing for some revised thinking amongst the humanitarian 
system here and amongst humanitarian agencies here. So that's kind of one thing, revising the way that we're thinking about it. Secondly, what you talk about is exactly right. It's a coordination challenge. Um, it's a coordination challenge whether people turn up with goods that are not appropriate in a disaster zone or indicate their desire to do so. I think where social media gives us an advantage is, is around what I talked about at the beginning, this issue of two-way communication. So at the outset of a disaster, what are the messages that we need to convey to people who want to help? How can you help? And that requires a joined upness and a coordination amongst international humanitarian organizations, national NGOs, social media platforms around how are we gonna get that message out and what are we trying to say to people? And the bottom line message I think we all agree on is don't send jumpers to Aceh. Give us money because we know how to process money. It's the easiest thing to use. Um, and Kirsten, of course, will turn around and say, and then we can give the money to the people in cash transfers. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole, other, that's a whole other, other discussion. But I think there's an incumbency on all of us to get ourselves organized and more joined up about what it is that we want to be putting out there beyond isn't UNHCR or UNICEF or IOM or OCHA doing a great job at responding to this crisis. Let's get a lot more sophisticated about what we're trying to say to people who want to help. We definitely can. We've got a few more questions back here. Yeah. Sorry, this is not directly uh, related to uh, communications, but uh, you are able to raise a lot of money ad hoc. Uh, do you get in any conflict with tax? Tax. I mean, if you raise ten million dollars in one day. Tax problems. Tax. Chinese of the tax policy for the, founder, the foundation is the free tax. Yeah, it's a, I think it's, it's a normal, yeah. Because we, 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 um, we, are, we have the license of the public foundation and also in China there is a free tax for, yeah. Yeah, one more down. Um, I just wanted to follow on from uh, Oliver's point. Within, I think it was about three hours of the Oklahoma tornado, I think Twitter was posting a link how you can help, um, you know, support people in, in Oklahoma. So I think there's lots of capacity for social media and also more traditional media to sell a message of what people can do because then people feel more valuable and I think the, the network, the, the Weibo network is just another example of that. Are there any more questions, Joe? Here we go. Yes, I just wanted to raise one, uh, one issue that uh, I tend to focus a lot of my efforts on disaster risk reduction and Something that, that's happening now, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at working with the World Bank on this Open Cities Initiative, and the idea for that is, is really to, to crowdsource the information that you might use in a humanitarian uh, response. In other words, you'd get the on-the-ground base information that would be extremely useful to understand the populations, where they are, where the lifeline infrastructure is, all of that. And in the process, you can engage a lot of volunteers that, that have access to the smartphones, the GPS, all that that could actually be a core that could really help you in a response as opposed to just relying on random Twitter feeds, they could be put to work really providing assessments and, and a bigger picture. And I'm wondering if, if you uh, talk about that at all in the report or, or what your thoughts are on that. Should we talk about the, the uh, distractions of social media? Um, no, I, all I w it was really trying to say is that the, uh, it seems like there'd be a real benefit to working with, with large groups of volunteers that do have access to this, this technology, but they can actually serve a greater social good, people that don't have that access. And one thing that comes to mind is this Open Cities Initiative from the World Bank, where they're working really at, at crowdsourcing maps that give you the baseline information that could be very helpful for a response. And these volunteers could also go out during response or be part of that response, providing 
solid assessment information that they've already been trained to do um, before the events happen. I mean, if I can go back a couple of years um, to, to Haiti, um, and uh, there's another report, which is a pre precursor to this, but we weren't so clever with the, uh, the launching and the publicity on that. It's called Disaster Relief 2.0, uh, and it was a report done by the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative uh, in cooperation with the UN, found, well, funded by the UN Foundation uh, and with, with us at OCHA. And what we were interested there was exactly this phenomenon of uh, the fact that Haiti was kind of the first big disaster where we saw the crowd come in. Uh, in, in, in some very interesting ways. And that report basically put out some ideas around the creation of some kind of mechanism or system that could be put into place. Now, I was a co-author of that report, but I can't for the life of me remember what we actually suggested, except that there were sort of four components to it around more academic think thinking around this, linking uh, the academic community and the humanitarian community far more closely, and two other parts, and I can't remember what they were. But, but there is some thinking going on around this, and I think this report, touches, it, this report touches on that. But I think, sort of an equal part, we're at the beginning of this. Um, and what we now need to do is basically pick this report up, go through it in some detail, and say, what are the next pieces of work that need to be done? And certainly, you know, you can talk to various people in this room, and you'll get a big variety of views on the utility value of crowdsourcing, the verifiability of crowdsourcing. Just because lots of people say something is so, is it? Um, so there are, there are a lot of questions around, around that. So I don't think I have an answer to your question, but I think we need to talk about it more, we need to think about it more, and there needs to be more research. So if anybody is interested in taking that on, either here in the room or out there on the web, we'd be glad to hear from you. Did you have your hand up? Hmm? I did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, what, more, any more questions? Have we got any more things rolling down? I noticed a question came up, um, are we data farming or extracting relevant info from big data, which is pretty much the same stuff we've been talking about, I suppose. It's a really important thing where there's a lot of information flying around there, but I don't think anybody's really come up with a tool that act, can actually capture and put this data into some way we can sort of uh, read it and understand it. It's probably a, uh, a great tool if uh, Ocha had the money to sort of spare to be able to do that. The, um, cheers, mate. Got that one. The, um, any more questions? Any more comments from our speakers? Bob, about data, you got something to say? No, I would just, I would just underline that this coming week, starting on Monday the 3rd, is crowdsourcing week. It's a, it's a big event being held in Singapore, so I don't know if any of your organizations have a presence there, but it should be generating uh, some really interesting uh, avant-garde content in this space. If it's something you want to follow, I thought you might want to know about it. That's an invite. Sounds good. Anybody else? Joe? You're all good? Ramon, has he left the building? Very. Oh, he's here. He's talking. He's not concentrating. Any final comments, Ramon? <laughs> Would you like to, a uh, couple of closing comments? Yeah. No doubt, always. Um, I was just, the reason I had a conversation was just asking him, is, is, uh, is there anybody interested, any government that's interested in using that kind of data? Uh, because at the end of the day, um, uh, depending, uh, of course the situation depends from country to country, but for us, what, what we keep seeing is that there's this gap this, this, all of this, you know, a lot of action happening in this area, and the decision makers, the problem pointed out earlier, oops, it's just flying past them. Uh, I th somehow we need to bridge that gap so that, uh, well, uh, social media gives you the capacity to act even without government, but that's not an ideal situation. You would like to see government authorities and agencies more actively utilizing this kind of technology for to make more informed decisions, both in preparedness as well as in response. And I think that's the challenge that we want to address, which is why we want to see what's going to happen to this experiment about bringing long-haired guys and short-haired and crew-cut guys in one room. Um, we don't know how, you know, when you mix them all up together and ramble, we don't know what's going to happen. But uh, <laughs> I hope not too much. But we hope that something fruitful will happen, uh, that it will produce a process in which people start exchanging views and seeing the value of what each 
do. Uh, then just wish us, wish us luck, maybe. That's the last <laughs> thing I can ask you. <laughs> okay. Okay, and let's just see what we got. Uh, just the close comments. Uh, I, I think from for China now, the NGO capacity building is a big problem. The money maybe is not a big question, and how to spend money. And like uh, this case of the one foundation in this case of the Yang earthquake, three hundred million RMB, just one one program, how to spend it big issue and also, you know, pressure. Two, two million user focus how to spend my money. Yeah, this is a big, big question for now Chinese NGO. And now we need, I think we need help. And also, you know, for the, for the Chinese NGO, uh, the user, the donor, want to focus how to spend my money in the program. If you spend my money to the capacity building, maybe no. Well, how to spend? How to have them? I think uh, today we, we I feel, I, I view, review my Weibo, and we in the in the, in, the, in China we talk about in a very government and also the uh, founder, the, the founder, <coughs> the foundation. They just uh, talk and uh, how to found the solution, the NGO capacity building. And maybe for the international NGO, we have a cooperation relationship with help them. Yeah, this is my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, um, an interesting point about how to spend money. I'm always sort of ch chasing it around myself. I suppose with that, if there's no more comments or questions, any more thoughts, we'll uh, finish off the broadcast very soon. The report's available online if you haven't already read it. Um, the people from Ocha would be very happy if everybody out there and in here can continue on the discussion some way. And I think we're, it's a contact through the policy department, as far as I understand. Is that right? Yeah? Um, thank you to uh, Ian for the, is that correct, hosting this, that's what they did, yep, great people. <laughs> and uh, streaming, doing the streaming for us. Uh, the speakers, of course, thank you for travelling here and talking and taking your time to further educate us all. And remember, communication is a basic need and a right. Thank you very much.